to begin and we are going to touch on some of those stories uh, including sat navs <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we will start uh, Josie and Helen with the times and of course we have to go with what's going on in the Korean yeah. peninsula it is pretty scary stuff mm -hmm. actually this um, obviously it all it all comes off the back of uh, President Trump's armada mm -hmm. approaching the Korean peninsula but now um, you know Korea's reacted and said it, it, you know, they've said we 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 can bomb um, if if mm. the U.S. makes a preemptive strike, we can bomb South Korea within minutes. U.S. troop bases are at risk in Guam, in Japan. You know, it really is flexing mm. its military might. Mm. Um, and the the question is, you know, what is Trump? doing the right thing here by flexing his military muscles. Well, what do you um, think? Do well, you think he is? Or? On the one hand, you think this, is, this is the question, isn't it? Because Trump is Trump and he's highly whimsical and provocative. On the one hand, we have to be tough. It is by taking the softly, softly diplomatic approach to kind of you know, military conflicts in the past. That's how Russia's gained too much power. Um, you know, it, we've got to be tough. But at the same time, it is good to be tough if you've got a strategy. So President Trump is um, whimsical and he's also very egotistical. We had the attack last week on um, Syria. Uh, in the Syria mm. and also the, yesterday, the, the yesterday that yeah. the big the the Emory AB bomb. He's had a very positive reaction to that. Even you know both Republicans and Democrats who have who have previously been anti-Trump have said mm. you did the right thing. Mm. Great, you went into Syria. That's going to really make Trump happy. So what we've got to just hope that Trump is not going into mm. North Korea fueled by this, hey, everyone thinks exactly. I'm brilliant because I'm going to be a war president. We well, hope he's got a bit more strategy behind that. And he has got good advisors. He's got um, General Mattis, who's very well respected. So we've just mm. got to hope that there's a good, responsible mm. team behind him, and this is not just his sort of Trump being, uh, mm. being Trump. statistical. Yeah. Mm. Well, Josie, I mean, the North Koreans have said there preemptive strike mm -hmm. um, do you think that mr. Trump would do that or would they wait and see what North Korea does because North Korea we're, we're used to these tests mm. I think I suppose the worry here is that it it could be their sixth nuclear test mm -hmm. um, who do you think is gonna show their hand first well I think what we've seen and as you were just saying what we've seen over the last couple of weeks is that Trump is willing to act quite quickly and uh, quite uh, sort of instinctively I suppose gut reaction knee-jerk reaction and I think that if he gets any excuse or if he gets any indication from the North Korean side that there really could be you know a, a, a heating up even more of the situation mm. he's definitely going to be the first to act because in the past we've always said oh it's just North Korea you know mm. it's bluster it's saber rattling mm. but now that there is reaction mm -hmm. from you know the US that's mm -hmm. saying something and certainly the Daily Telegraph if we just very quickly mm. turn to the Daily Telegraph um, CIA Mike Pompeo is saying this is how we're going to act now. Yeah, you know, so that's watch out. It's mm. something that he's come out in support because, of course, this is the first time he's spoken publicly in January. And, of course, you know, the CIA and Donald mm. Trump didn't exactly have a great introduction when he was first inaugurated because of yeah. all the, uh, the investigations into mm. his links with, with Russia. But now he's coming, uh, and now yeah. he's waded in and said, actually, yeah, this is the, this is the right thing. You yeah. know, we've got to do something. Mm. But this raises the question of, why are they only going in now? So North Korea has been a threat mm. for years and we've years. We've heard of the red lines. Yes, exactly. so, and, but yeah. we've kind of ignored it because the whole time the fear has been, well, maybe they have got nuclear weapons, so let's not provoke them. Mm. But the longer you leave it, the worse that threat mm. gets. So we've just got to hope that they haven't actually got the capability to launch mm. a long-range nuclear mm. missile. But the thing is, we don't know. Like, mm. at least with, you know, other... Um, conflicts Syria mm. Afghanistan we kind of know what they're up mm. to we knew that you know mm. Assad had mm -hmm. stocks of chemical weapons but we don't know what our enemy is so we've just got to hope mm. and I think equally right we have to kind of wait and see whether what we're hearing from the US and from Pompeo mm. from Trump is just rhetoric mm. or whether it actually is action and whether they're gonna put their money where their mouth is so to speak because <laughs> Sorry. It's yeah. not just North Korea that the CIA are directing at here. They also mention Iran, don't they? And That's you'd have right. thought that relations were warming between the two, or rather, you know, that the, the tensions had stopped. Yeah. Um, but they, they mention Iran as well to take note. Yeah, and I think part of that is to do with the fact that they're kind of 
they've kind of been fortified by what we've seen in the last couple of weeks mm. with Afghanistan, with Syria, and the response that, as you say, internally, especially mm. from the US, that, that the Trump administration has got for those actions. Mm. Um, and I think this is just kind of like a bit of a general warning from Pompeo saying, don't mess with us. Mm. We've got the ability and the capacity to retaliate. Uh, and equally, at the same time, North Korea is mm. saying, if you mess with us, you'll probably regret it. Yeah. And Iran is going to... Exactly. It, it's exactly. Gonna it's just a, it's a mess. Korea. It's a big mess. Mr. Trump was never a fan of the Iran deal in the first place, was he? Um, That's right. OK, Josie, I'd like you to pick up um, with your business hat <laughs> on. Um, we're going to turn to the FT and zero hours contracts in the news yet again. That's right, um, yeah. yeah. Let, let me on, pass let me just tonight. There you go. Paper. There you Make go. sure I've got it here. There got we it go. There. Yeah, okay. Here. Yeah. So this is a story in the uh, FT. It's um, an interview that the FT did with Matthew Taylor, who, of course, was um, Tony Blair's uh, former policy chief. And he was... Um, he was basically given the job by Theresa May back in October to look at the changing face of the labour market uh, and specifically the rise of what we're calling the gig economy. So mm -hmm. these sort of zero hour contracts, um, people being on working in jobs where they actually don't know in the morning whether they're going to be called up and said, yes, we need you to come into work. No, we don't need you. Um, and what he's saying or what he's proposing is that um, the minimum wage is actually topped up for these kind of jobs um, to provide a bit of a premium. And the, the idea is that this would discourage employers uh, from basically taking advantage of these uh, gig economy workers, zero hour contract workers. Um, and uh, yeah, so it would basically provide the best of two worlds. It would provide flexibility for people who are in the jobs and want flexibility. Um, and it would ensure that, that employers can keep zero hour contracts mm. on their books, basically. I'm not sure if a uh, minimum wage you know, or, or rather a surplus on the wage is the mm. right way to get because the minimum wage debate is all about okay is it is it great in that it offers workers mm -hmm. flexibility and certainly as a as a freelancer and lots mm. of people in media are freelancers it's i like i like the idea of zero hours mm -hmm. contract it would offer me flexibility but on the other hand does it does it just does it make workers mm. very insecure so that's, that's the right. kind of debate now i think a way to get round that because one of the, the problems of this is there's a, there's a report highlighted here by one Worker saying that they um, were told to be ready, at seven. To be ready right. at seven, and then they got a phone call saying, Actually, no, we don't need mm -hmm. you. So, I think a better way of tackling that because that's wrong, that's really bad, mm. is to say, All right, Well, what about bringing in some sort of minimum notice period? Yeah. So, if an employee mm -hmm. says, Right, we need you for 15 hours next week, but they've got to give minimum mm -hmm. 24 hour notice, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they turn around and say, Actually, we only need you for. Yeah for five, then yeah. they have to pay half, you know, don't have to pay mm -hmm. the full rate, but pay half. Because mm -hmm. by introducing a, a sort of a minimum wage for zero hours contracts, mm -hmm. What the employees will do is they'll just reduce the base minimum yeah. wage and then add the surplus yeah. on top. And, to get and of course, there's a question whether it's enough in the first place. That's right. Absolutely. right. We're going to stay with wages. Yeah. Turn to the Guardian, and how about ninety-five pounds an hour, an hour? But yeah. Josie, you were saying, if they're short, and we're talking about the NHS here, mm -hmm. they're going to pay. That's right. So it's it's a hospital in uh, Peterborough City, Peterborough City Hospital, mm -hmm. which apparently is offering doctors ninety five pounds an hour as this staffing crisis in the NHS is just absolutely escalating. And uh, yes, it is an awful lot of money. I mean, we were working out a ten hour shift, you basically pocketing a mm -hmm. grand. Yeah. But ultimately, there's no one available to do the job. And, so and they do point out it's A and E, so they can't it's, mess yeah. around it's there. A &E, can they? It's A and E. It's yet another headline that is telling us, screaming in our face, that the NHS is in crisis, that something needs to change. And my concern here is that this, <coughs> this is a vicious cycle. This is going to, the, the more stories that come out like this, the fewer people are going to want to mm. pursue a career in the medical. Practice. Or rather, if they're getting ninety-five pounds an hour, maybe they will. Maybe they <laughs> will. I mean, this, this is it's a great investigation, actually, that the Guardian's mm. done here. They've highlighted um, emails that have come from admin staff going to medical mm. staff, and highlighted the sheer urgency mm -hmm. in these messages, which just demonstrates how, how desperate. desperate they are. Yeah, and yeah. In one, it says, I'm sorry to be sending so many messages, but I'm in real need here. I'm practically begging at this point. I really need some help. Um, that was one from the John Radcliffe Hospital. There's another saying, can anyone, in capital mm. letters, help? It really is a matter of keeping the department safe. So, mm. I, I mean, that yeah. just Thoughts. really raises questions of whether it's safe for these doctors 
to be working. If they're calling on people who say maybe they've got weekend plans, maybe they've yeah, had a late yeah, night, yeah. maybe they're not fit to work, but then they're being incentivised. The schedule is crossing their fingers, now. aren't they? They're not going to be yeah. safe to treat yeah. patients. And of course, Easter is crunch time. Yes, the holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, this, this made me giggle. Um, the male, drivers must use a sat-nav to pass the test. I often shout at my sat-nav, so I'm not sure I would have passed my <laughs> test if I had to use um, this in my driver's test. What, what do you make of all this? So no three-pointers. I think it's well. great, actually, because it, it's time to change, right? So yeah. the, the tests were set in a time when cars we're different. So every time I drive a car, I don't own a car, but, but I'm a driver. But aren't the roads the same? You still the need the same, same skills, yeah, don't you? No, you don't, because the cars are now automatic, power steering, all these things. So they're now saying that we're not going to have the three-point turn in the test. We're going to have to learn how to use a sat-nav system instead. I think that is a sensible reflection of how cars have changed. You don't need to learn to have to do a three-point turn. These I days. still use three-point turns, cars. don't you? <laughs> well, I actually have to put my hands the up here and say I can't drive. I was just about to say. <laughs> so, when I do pass the test, I think I'll be mighty happy that I won't have to do a three-point turn by the sound of things. Well, the Reversing around the corner is the killer. Oh, <laughs> don't. It's become a multitasking. There's so many mm. there's technology in cars now mm, that yeah. actually part of the skill of driving is to learn to multitask. Yeah. It is to You've got to be able to listen to your sat-nav and drive. So actually, it's right that they test that. Maybe the test should also be avoiding your phone whilst you're being tested. Absolutely. Yeah, introduce the distractions. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I wonder if we can get one more in. Talk about cars and they're now saying that car loans could be um, could equal or rather have echoes of the subprime mortgage crisis mm. now that's worrying mm. yeah so this is a story in the Telegraph um, and saying that the amount being borrowed to buy new cars has actually trebled in the last eight years to 30 billion pounds a year as you say mm. echoes of the sub subprime mm. crisis and it's, it's scary, this is getting out of control, and I think the issue is that we're forgetting what the subprime crisis mm. was like and what damage that really did cause. Our memories are fading, aren't That's they? That's right. And unlike, you know, the, in a way it's worse with cars, because you never actually pay it off, because you just keep getting, at least yeah. That's right. if they were over-lending with houses, you'd eventually pay it off and you've got a house, but a car depreciates, so even when you pay mm -hmm. it off, you still need another car. Yeah. Would you stretch yourselves, because we, uh, in the past, we'd always stretch ourselves for a mm. mortgage, wouldn't we? Would you stretch yourselves for a car? No. Financially, no, no, no. no. Do it. but I live in London though, so I don't need to go. It yeah. would probably be different for someone who doesn't have the transport links that we have and mm. do need a car to get around. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. we're going to end it there, but basically, the Bank of England are now investigating this because there are, there are huge, huge concerns. Yeah. But you'll be back in half an hour, yeah, for our yeah. final paper. Please yeah. do, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it from the papers. Um, we've got the headlines coming up, and again, of course.